เดี๋ยวคิดว่าควรจะเริ่มได้แล้วนะฮะเพราะว่าเดี๋ยวจะเล็กนะครับ Good morning everybody um, Today is a special lecture We are very happy to have Mr. Max c h i v i t a l a and Mr. Kuto l e k u n a here But Mr. Kuto is on the way now <laughs> He come later So let me introduce a little about Mr. Max first um, Max c h i v i t a l a was graduated in architecture from uh, University of s u t g a r t and um, and p i n o s i s t e r t e c h n i c i a n h o p s c h u l e r for Zurich or ETH in 2006 and after that he co-founded Hen Studio B in Berlin and was working for r e m p u h a s OMA besides he has been a regular studio instructor and guest critic at uh, TU Berlin, ETH Zurich and TU Dresden Uh, Studio c h i v i t a l a is one of the four teams from worldwide that have been selected to attend uh, the International Audi Future Award 2014. And Max is this expert who is interested in urban future mobility, which is um, <coughs> the new approach in architecture design, coordinated with the transportation system of the city. So therefore, the words from Studio c h i v i t a l a is an uh, to b u r l i n g the boundaries between urban design, urban development, and architecture. So I think this is the time. Please welcome Mr. Max to give a lecture. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Um, If anything of English was not understandable, please raise your hand if you have a question, and we figure it out together. Then, Yo Yo is my uh, personal translator today. <laughs> so um, great that this worked out, uh, and I can talk today here, as mentioned and very well introduced. Our interest is architecture and urban planning through the view of um, um, urban mobility. And as we look at the 20th century, we can see how um, actually urban mobility shaped our cities. Uh, on the right, you see Los Angeles that was actually designed by the car. Uh, you know, highways and, 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 and roads are structuring the city. It's a low-rise urban sprawl. On the left, you see uh, the opposite, New York, which is designed through the elevator. Uh, the driving, you know, the driving urban mobility concept is here, the elevator. And we think um, if we, that's the 20th century, and the beginning of the 21st century is actually where we find uh, a combination of both. And it's a very extreme um, 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 kind of result, result, especially in the in the in the um, growth markets here in Asia. Uh, in China, we see um, massive road structures, and then we find isolated uh, towers. So we actually, what we, we it's a very modern approach to the city. Um, in the, you know, we, as we learned it in Europe in the 20th century, as a, which is not a good way, we separate functions, we separate people, and therefore we have to travel a lot with a car. Uh, and so this is uh, when I was working there, um, and we, I got coffee for the uh, entire studio. I had to take down the elevator, I had to take a taxi to the next cafe, uh, come back with a taxi, uh, with a coffee in my hand, and what was more expensive at the end was the coffee. Not the taxi ride, and I think then something went totally wrong. Basically, I, mean, I believe we actually really forgot about the people uh, we're building our cities for. And this is it sharp enough? No, could be sharper maybe. I don't know. Is it technician? Technic guy here? It's really not sharp. But... It's like, okay, so because this shows actually um, people that move through the city in different carriers, in subways, uh, in buses, cars. And pedestrians, and um, it's on purpose. It's an image. Um, it's not moving. Everything is stuck with, because we believe urban mobility and the city. Um, they really, they really stuck. We we stuck in 20th century technology, and we 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 are uh, we we cannot scope the problems we find today uh, with this technology anymore. So we're trying different things, um, also from a technology level. For example, urban roller coasters. Uh, 
this is technology uh, has been proven. We, uh, you can write three-dimensionally in any theme park. Uh, but for example, if we introduce swivel joints here and here, you actually have a smooth ride. Uh, it doesn't matter how, where the train would go, vertically or horizontally. And these concepts could be integrated into existing uh, mobility infrastructure, such as subways, uh, and they could go horizontally or even vertically. And um, this is a, it's, so it's not a roller coaster experience. You don't throw up every morning you go to work. It would be a very convenient uh, travel. And so we can think about um, kind of um, vertical arrangements of cities. This is kind of uh, different villages, buildings stacked on top of each other. And then we always have uh, kind of these stations uh, where you can, so subway stations on top of each other. And then you separate or you, you continue your walk through an elevator or the escalator in a traditional way. We believe also the, the relationship between the city center and the periphery, we should renegotiate. Um, it, urban planning is most of the time thinking in plan from the top, and I think we should have a more three-dimensional approach to it, um, a li less top-down uh, view. We should really think about the city as a three-dimensional structure. Um, so why can we not also think about uh, spiraling structures, uh, ways that are the same way in horizontal, we just spiral them up and so the same distance, just uh, in space, differently arranged. And then we came up with this image we call Babel Town, and uh, we call it on purpose Babel Town because this is an utopian image. This is not, we don't want to build it like this, um, but as a, uh, Babel was a story uh, from an utopian idea to, um, to build a city to the sky um, and God actually, uh, the story is like God punished the people who wanted to build and uh, introduced uh, languages, different languages, so they couldn't build this, uh, they couldn't communicate and they couldn't build the structure anymore. Um, so we thought it's a good kind of analogy uh, and I hope you, we speak the same uh, language and you understand my language today, I try my best. So. But again, please, uh, any question, raise your hand and we, we figure it out together, I think, okay? Um, so again, this is a new Ethiopian image, it's an idea, a theory, this is not, we don't want to build it like this, but there is some uh, concept we really liked about this. For example, what if we um, start hanging architecture? What if buildings produce green in the city and they don't consume it as normally? So they, uh, the, the rooftops combi tops combined would produce green space. And this is an idea we took further, and you know these two people here, maybe, that sit over here, Jules and Jojo, they were working with us in Berlin. So the idea, how can we structurally um, can produce such spaces, and, and the idea of minimizing the footprint on the ground so we can give space back to the people and we actually maximize uh, the space on the top and for green, for public. Um, so because we are working in the studio Maybe I should say this because we, are, we, are not, we don't have traditional clients. We have much more uh, research collaborations with big companies, uh, multinational companies. One is Schindler, an elevator company from Switzerland, one of the big companies uh, producing elevators. And they are, um, they are questioning themselves. They, they don't want to produce, they want to continue producing uh, uh, um, elevators, they want to think of different approaches, different ideas, and this is why we work with them together. And this year, as you mentioned, uh, we have Audi, the car manufacturer, as another mobility provider, as a research partner. So that's why we have the possibility to think, uh, to, to, to come up with these ideas and uh, actually get paid for it, you know, somebody has to pay these bills well. So, um, an elevator is, this is a traditional typology of an elevator, we have the core, Circulation is happening, we have structure, and we have floor slabs that are you know, normally uh, not doing any job for us. They just to carry us, but they don't, they don't perform. Um, so we have the idea of actually separating uh, the core, so the main, uh, the main um, 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 loads come, come in the periphery, and we can actually have tensile structures in the middle, so the, the floors become part of the structural system um, of the of the structure. And uh, as we said, we wanted to give space back to 
the city, that could be public space. And so it becomes a idea of a diagonal elevator. It's continuous. It could go up and down. So there's no dead end. It's a continuous loop of uh, circulation. And, and then you see on the top already a little bit of green looking there. So this is a view from the top. And we could, this is a Berlin scenario where you could actually also use space that is at the moment uh, not used. Uh, so we could kind of plug in from, from the top to the city. And then we have public spaces on top. And this is a very big structure. This is much more like a village. It's not just one house, one building. It's a, it's, it's a little city uh, village, a little a neighborhood. And so we also thought um, we shouldn't think of it as a building. It's much more. Um, land that is stacked on top of each other, and then you can um, then you can um, uh, inhabit each of the of the floors separately, um, and you can also um, the idea for living. So you can actually build your little house within that. It's not a building which is with has, with has a facade, and we say it's a hotel or something. We said it's an open uh, structure. It's an open system that can host different functions. Um, so, but it's much more, so basically it's three-dimensionally urban planning, and then it's like interior architecture design. So you could, you could make this uh, division. So we took this idea of the open structure further and said, okay, how, if you look at a Berlin block on the left, um, this is a traditional street block, and we have separate entrances to each house. And um, therefore, we really also isolate people. They don't; these people never meet those. Um, so we we said, like, why? This is, of course, due to land ownership. Um, and we, I mean, we see it as our kind of um, approach to question even these kind of fundamental things and to come up with different ideas. So, for example, what if we split it up and say we have horizontal circulation through this block as well? Um, so this is the same block just cut away. So we we proposing this prototype for a um, for a little village neighborhood uh, that we're developing together with Schindler now, and we think about where to uh, implement it first. Um, maybe China could be a place for this. Um, so the idea is we call it hashtag building. Um, so if you want to Twitter, it's like hashtag urban <laughs> urban design. Um, and that the main fun, or the main element is actually a courtyard. Um, so it's, you don't live at the street A, B, and then floor Z. It's really like the idea of a, of a courtyard that you are relating to and you, you have your identity to. Um, and then you have much more private uh, moments here, and you have public crossings uh, whenever they, they cross. And so the idea is really to separate the functions, to not think of architecture as a design out of one hand, where you think of a facade um, up until the floor, and every the interior design is coming out of one office. We say we want to we want to separate these functions. We think in structural systems, and then the floors and roofs, and then you can actually each individual user could build their own units. And I mean, we all know that even um, one floor you can build by yourself without a problem. Two floors even people can three sometimes, but then. When the first earthquake comes, these structures collapse because they're not um, engineered. So the idea is to say, can we can we give a certain structure to it, and then people can actually um, host this uh, and, and inhabit that, that structure. Uh, and we call this an urban shelf. It's a really like a think of it as a bookshelf, and uh, it's a it's a basic structure, and you can you, know, you, you put as you put your books in there. Now you could put your um, uh, your individual units in there. So it's also the idea of like, can we can we get the user, the citizen, more as a somebody who is more active in, in building the city instead of just um, buying a piece of uh, a piece of land, an apartment. Um, so it's a very top-down organization. Somebody planned it, and he, he can as much as he can afford, he can. Um, by an apartment, but can he can he become more productive? Can he become more a maker of space rather than a user or consumer? So, and as I said, like the main 
function is actually the, the courtyard, and that's where this main circulation happens. It's this idea of a ramp. Um, so it's also not an elevator, it's not a stair, it's the idea really of a, of a ramp where you can, with like micro mobilities, electric mobilities, you can actually uh, go up uh, go up in there and then circulate through this whole structure. Here we see an image from the courtyard interior. And it's, um, so the idea is really like this is a street. On the, on the third floor, um, a public space, um, there is public functions um, that happen um, throughout the floors. Uh, it's, it's not, as we know them very traditionally, the ground floor is um, public and then everything on top is private. So it really, uh, the question is how can we break up this traditional um, urban planning? So to sum it up, I mean, this is uh, the diagram that ex should explain this approach uh, the urban shelf and it's really this top-down planning concept and we were working a lot with the ETH um, where they uh, studied um, slums in Sao Paulo um, and Rio de Janeiro and the idea of like bottom-up um, 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 urban design from the slums what can we learn of it like self-organization um, where people um, generate their own identity through their structures. So how can we combine those and this idea of this urban shelf that we can actually have a symbiosis out of a, a kind of top-down approach, planning, structure, and a bottom-up uh, user-generated city. And I mean, I guess you all know this number in 2050 that we have six billion people living on the living in the urban um, 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 metropolitan areas worldwide, but what's, what was uh, really frightening to us is that the, the, the forecast is like half of them, meaning three billion will live in slums. And um, so this is, this is um, a forecast by the UN, it's not by us, I mean this is uh, scientific, so to speak. So the, um, the question is how can we, can we come up with ideas to, 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 um, to solve that those problems because I think with the common um, the strategies we have right now this will end up in a very uh, dramatic um, um, condition in 2050 um, I will be 70 75 you will be alive we all will uh, see this and I think we should really think about can we can we come up with not traditional ideas to, to come up with, uh, to scope those problems and uh, yeah, so really like an open structure that can be implemented um, in different places around the world and then therefore be, um, they can also look different um, in any place uh, because it is user generated. People um, um, bring their own identity into the shelf uh, and it becomes very site specific and individual with each implementation. And I mean yesterday I went to CM Square and uh, I think it's really fascinating this one, uh, even though it's a shopping mall, but I think it was really fascinating this idea of three dimensional um, urban design, mobility, it's, uh, everything happens here. It's like three dimensional coming. <laughs> Hello, hey. <laughs> so you missed Sao Paulo, I just talked about Sao Paulo. So um, it's a, that was a really amazing place. Um, Urban mobility, first floor, open, closed, everything is, is actually one, um, there's not, no division anymore between public, private, inside, outside, first floor, ground floor. That was really, for me, a very amazing experience, I have to say. And so um, I guess you are actually experts in what we are talking about. You know it much better, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't tell you what, uh, about this. You know it, you, you know it anyway. Uh, but that's in a way what we're trying to, uh, what we're trying to approach, what we're trying to, 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 to succeed. Um, that was a really good example. And so now, as you said, mentioned the Audi Urban Future Award, I want to present you this project. Um, and we talked, you know, urban design three-dimensionally, mobility as becoming more three-dimensionally, and this project actually brings all these things together and um, um, 
you mentioned it was a competition, a bike competition by Audi against three other teams. One was from Seoul, uh, Korea, one was from Mexico City, and one from Boston. And we were the team in Berlin. And um, our vision was actually to come up with this organic traffic landscape, and that's modeled around individual functions and individual experiences. And as this guy shows, it should become fun again, you know, simply uh, enjoyable. Because I think um, urban mobility, and I mean, good you just came in by car, I guess, and it was not fun, probably. Um, I mean, it becomes such a hassle, and um, we have to, you know, think about how we can come up with different experience because um, at the end, the user will decide what he wants, and, um, you know, as all these clients, Will, it's the ones who are not happy at the moment. Uh, they sit in a car by themselves and they are uh, they ask for change. And I think we should actually listen uh, to their to their desire. Um, so for this project, um, we was inspired by destination control. Um, it's a system out of the elevator um, and logistics. Um, I will explain later. For this project, we actually wanted to blur the boundaries between individual, uh, private, and public transportation, buses, subways, and so on. And we wanted to hack and activate different infrastructures that were in the city. Um, subway tunnels, uh, elevated train roads, and this is Berlin, remember, again, this is Berlin. So um, can we think of a subway tunnel as a fast lane uh, for a car, maybe? Um, and as you all know, Germany is like the car's uh, country, uh, for world's famous car country. And it's actually 75 years uh, after we designed the Volkswagen, um, the Beetle, uh, we wanted to ask Audi to come up with a new uh, typology of a new car, a new urban vehicle, uh, because we don't need to have cars that run 150 kilometers in the city. We don't need to have cars that, um, that have four seats, uh, we're mainly alone in the car, and um, um, they don't, um, they shouldn't, of course, run on gas anymore. We should think in other alternatives. So that's what we worked together with uh, Audi on that. And we were, for this, also inspired by nature. This is uh, a real image, this is not Photoshop. This is like uh, these goats, crazy goats somewhere in. Uh, in uh, North Africa, they climb the trees for their for the uh, bees, uh, I think it's bees, yeah, for the fruits up there. And um, then, what we showed at the end is a result how our Berlin future could look like uh, once we achieve this. And I would present you this project more like a journey through time and space. Uh, we will start today in the city center. And we will, um, on our way to a new urban development, that's um, um, the airport at the moment, uh, but which will turn into new urban development. We go, we're going there for a workshop. We'll find a test track in 2017. And on our way back, we, I will show you our, our vision for 2035 for the entire city of Berlin. So you can uh, you know, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride now. Um, so if you look at Berlin um, today, and now we need sound actually, yeah, it is, wait, let me go back, can we have, yeah, second, so Berlin of course is not as, you know, big as, as Bangkok and therefore also it doesn't suffer the same scale of problems, and it is, yeah, we?
should come out. Okay, so Berlin today, yeah, um, as you see, 3.4 million people, really small compared to, for example, Bangkok. Um, it is, doesn't, okay. Um, but there's a lot of potential in the city, and uh, it's really in the making at the moment, and there's a really creative and innovative atmosphere. Um, sorry, just keep it out. Do you hear me like this? It works as well? Yeah? So, when we step outside in the morning on the street, we actually find this is much more a parking lot uh, than a street anymore. Most of the space is actually consumed by parking, not for driving. And um, this space in the entire city of Berlin sums up to over 7 million square meters. Um, a space that could actually host 200,000 people. And therefore, we have really have to ask ourselves, do we build our cities for the cars, or do we build our cities for people anymore? And um, even though just half of Berlin's uh, households do own a car by themselves, which is really little compared to other cities, um, we sum up with over 1.3 million cars in total. And each of them is occupied by one person, you know, so you spend a lot Spend alone our time, like around one hour per day, think back to maybe three, uh, by ourselves in these, uh, in these vehicles and these, in these isolated spaces. And uh, right now, car sharing is a big thing. It's much more, uh, we have more and more car sharing every day, which is great. But they are also be quite a And this is a short way of higher mobility. Uh, most of the people still drive in the car. Uh, around one third of the winners using a bike and walk. And around 27% of the uh, using public, tra public transportation. So that's the second biggest choice. And as I said in the beginning, we actually want to blur these boundaries. Uh, because you, um, people start to choose every day I'm taking to the car. More I take the subway, so they start uh, shifting around. We want to blur these boundaries and propose this collective mobility concept. So for example, if we look at the subway. So now we had about individual, let's look at public transportation. And because the subway is running on static timetables and frequencies, you can you always miss the subway. Always. You cannot uh, you cannot have um, just come in time. It doesn't matter if you just arrived, you always missed one before. Um, so you as an individual user always use uh, a lot of time. Also, if you want to uh, change lines, the moment is two and a half minutes per person. But if you sum up this for the entire system, we lose six years per total uh, in, uh, per day uh, of wasted time. And these tunnels stay empty most of the time. If you think about how expensive they are to build this Totally insane, actually. Uh, because we are not connected from each other, to each other, we have to pass through these artificial bottlenecks. And uh, they are ugly, they are expensive. And uh, we actually want to try to overcome this concept of a hub where you change directions by organizing flows in the city uh, through their destination. And this is this, I, I talked in the beginning about this airport which will be turned into a new urban development um, outside of the city. And this will be our test site for this new mobility concept. And the flyway is actually a test track that will bring us out there. Um, for this, we're using autonomous driving. As we know, autonomous driving is not allowed or possible at the moment in the urban environment. Google is testing this mostly in the, in the, uh, in the desert. So what we're proposing is something to bring autonomous driving into the city, into the public context. And therefore we found this old elevated uh, train track that was built in the 1920s. And because it's not part of the public space, we can actually bring it up, um, autonomous driving into the city with this, on, on this track. So it's a protected corridor. And it's actually, you now you see it set up, it's actually four kilometers long, it's called Siemens Bahn, it was built by a, a company Siemens, 
and we want to reconnect it to the public uh, network in the south, which is a subway and a fast uh, train. And then we have this station in Van Heide that will become our kind of entrance gate to this uh, test track. And then in the north, you see the urban, the new urban development. Uh, there's going to be an elevated extension of this track into the site. And as a first kind of hybrid solution between public and individuals, you can see there's a train of uh, these electric cars uh, taken off and then splitting on site to serve individual um, destinations. Um, and then on the way back, they can regroup and become a train again in order to save space and also to feed into the public transportation network. And they, these tracks, uh, these trains, uh, they can by bypass each other and always in the curve. Because they're in the curve, we can actually design them as these super elevations so they can you know, save space uh, for other functions. Because it's always a mono, mono track. So whenever they, they cross, these trains cross each other, we can do this in the diagonal so we can save space. Uh, so we can have other functions for buildings. There's an uh, open air cinema showing that right now. I don't know if you remember the night right now. Or you can throw it out there. Uh, yeah, so because it can actually host other functions, cafes, sports, uh, entertainment, it becomes really like a new urban landmark. Um, probably you all know the Highline project in New York, so it's something similar to this, and it's open, open to the public, and therefore becomes a big benefit to the local neighborhood as well. So this is how it would look like. It's halfway test track for autonomous driving and the pathway public park for Berliners. So if we want to experience ourselves uh, to become these test pilots on the highway, first thing we do, we give in our final destination, our address where we want to go to. And remember, we're still on the way there. Yeah? So our neighbor, or our colleague, who's going to join us for the workshop is at the other end of the train now. But he, because he has the same destination, he has the same car that is assigned to him. In this case, car number three. And once we reach the station, we just cross the platform, and then we have these, these electric cars waiting uh, ready to board for us. And there is number three. And here's our colleague who's going to join us. She, she's she's going to join us for the workshop today. So once in the car, you see, first thing, there's no more steering wheel because it's autonomous driving and autopilot is active. And because it is part of the public transport network, you don't have to buy one of these cars. Everybody can experience it. Um, it's like riding the subway. And uh, so you see, like uh, along this old train track, former stations turn into uh, cafes and bars for Berliners and for tourists from around the world. And now we are approaching this new urban development. And this is like a research and science park where future technologies for, um, for the urban environment are in invented, but also tested on site. And this, this is why we can test autonomous driving in the public space there. Because we were talking to the planners, and we have the possibility to implement it there. And as we see, we are dropped off just in front of our door. And the car takes off to pick up the next customer. And so this is a, in this project we said this is a test track. This is our vision for 2017. But we want to take this further and say what we have to learn by doing. Uh, and so what can we think about for the, the uh, further future in 2035 for the entire city of Berlin. And what we tested so far was autonomous driving. We kind of had the idea of infrastructure hacking, former elevated train tracks, now become a test track. And the idea of destination control that we will learn out of the elevators I explained to you now. Um, so this is what we tested locally. We just have to extend this to the entire city of Berlin. And the idea of like, as we saw, cars were coupled and decoupled now virtually, but we want to actually couple them physically. So that's why we need a new vehicle. Uh, and to do so, we will end up with a truly collective mobility concept. And 
as I said, we want to learn from elevators. Uh, we just took the elevator and uh, everybody was squeezed in there. And this is actually um, elevators that work without the system destination control. Yeah? So here, it's everybody goes in, it doesn't matter where they want to go. And inside, the cabin, everybody pushes the button where he wants to go. And that's the, re the result of this is actually like a stop and go traffic. And, you know, if you're the last one, you're probably quite annoyed by the end you get out the elevator. So, this is the normal way. Let's try it now, this time, on the right with destination. So, this is where you, in the lobby, tell the elevator where you want to go before you get into the cabin. So, then the system can group people together according to which door they want to go. As we see here. And that results in a very kind of direct way, and everybody is happy. Yeah. That's important. Everybody is happy. <laughs> but not only that, if everybody is happy, the entire system becomes also happier. You know, you can actually save energy, and you can save a lot of waiting time. So that's a, that's a paradox of that you make everybody happy, but also the system happy. And that's really very fundamental, and this is something we want to now, as a concept for a skyscraper, how can we take this to the city? So as these destinations are now floors on top of each other, we have to think of them as neighborhoods that are next to each other on horizontal plane. And for the navigation, for the, for the, for the system algorithm, it doesn't matter because um, this is just a coordinate, coordinate for the system. It doesn't matter if it's on top of each other or next to each other. The, the application can do this already today. So what we do, now we don't have a lobby anymore, but we have an iPhone, so we can actually put our destination there and therefore group people together. And then we want to have these transfer routes, which are above ground or underground, so we don't cross through other neighborhoods. Because that is the traffic that uh, produces congestion. So we want to have um, underground and above, uh, and, and above ground routes for the transfer. And once we reach our kind of final neighborhood, then we split up individually um, 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 on, the, on the surface again. Similar to what we do, once we get out the elevator, everybody walks his own way. So that means that actually every neighborhood, and that's a map of Berlin of neighborhoods, becomes a destination connected with all the other, uh, other neighborhoods for the city. And I showed you this image before, so the idea is above ground, using these existing infrastructures that are there, so these transfer routes. And, but now, of course, a car cannot go in the subway tunnel, so that's why we work together with Audi, what is a vehicle that could actually do this job. And this is where we got also inspired um, by nature. Now we're zooming in a lot, and this is a, we're looking inside a cell, a body cell, this is a cell of a skin. And what we find there is also different uh, roads. We find prime movers, these motor proteins, and we find cabins, these vesicles, where other uh, proteins are carried around through the cell. And if we let it run, it looks, actually it looks really funny, I'm sure you agree. <laughs> but uh, what's really interesting is this kind of, Coupling and decoupling of functions. Um, that's a, like the architecture is really decoupled. It's a systematic approach. And if we think about how can we apply this to a car, I mean, what we find there is that all these functions, the prime mover, the cabin, is packed underneath one um, body, under one um, um, piece of metal. And we learn from the designers that really. Once the car is designed, it's a really painful moment to cut out the door um, with this beautiful design uh, shape. And so what we're trying is to, inspired by the cell, now decouple those functions. Let's say the prime mover is in the periphery. We want to reduce the cabin side because we learn only one person riding in Berlin. So we don't need that much space. And the idea that the door becomes actually the main element because we want to couple things together. And if we bring those functions together, but loosely, we end up with a free-floating cabin uh, that, that allows us to go up and down very steep. Um, and you can imagine how big 
let's say this is a concept we call a flywheel. And it's actually the smallest unit uh, of this collective mobility system. And because it has this door it can now couple um, with, with all other, with different wheels, uh, it can grow into any direction because it has, of course, doors into both directions, a very spacious interior. Uh, they can turn into a, a transporter mall if you want to carry something with you. Um, and because it can turn, it always stays stable, no matter how steep up and down you're going. If you remember in the car, you always like feel every little thing go up and down. Um, so really three, to enable really three-dimensional uh, movement for the city. And it's really ugly. <laughs> So if you look at this, is different group configurations. You know, it can come actually in any group size you need it um, because it's part of the system. Um, so as a one-seater, um, it becomes much more like a personal assistant if you think about um, older people, disabled people. Um, as a two-seater, it could become a dating app. And as a three-seater, it could become a guitar concert on the go. But what's really most important about it, because I guess all of you might have good ideas how to use this system, it's an open innovation platform and there's this idea of the sharing economy growing at the moment. So this is really uh, a platform for this. It's a kind of iTunes uh, of urban mobility, you could say. And as I told you, we'll work together with the designers. Uh, they got really excited about this and sketched out different models and so this is the model we're picking now for our ride, ride home. Because now we remember now we're in the year 2035. And on the top you see this was our test site and now it's a system that works for the whole city. Um, and navigation became super easy now. The home button that we know is now finally available. Actually the flyer wheel is just one click away. And you see all the other people are also uh, part of the system and actually there is, I would argue there is no congestion in the system, it actually becomes better and better with every additional user because then it becomes stronger. This is an experience how it feels like to ride this flywheel. Um, it's really premium because it's only available, or it's there when you need it and where you need it exactly. So, you don't have to park it, that's really seamless um, experience, different uh, ramps and, uh, and tunnels connecting all the infrastructures together. Uh, you can even use power lines that are down there to charge the battery. And um, so this is where we couple with other people. And because we share now the same destination, uh, the chance to meet our neighbor on the way is much higher uh, than it was before. People they might have a different destination in the city, or we we actually just arrived at our final destination neighborhood. So that's why we decouple, we turn back into the last mile mode, and we slow down. And together with our neighbor, see here, uh, we continue our way to the surface. And this kind of kind of uh, traffic landscape we can also extend to the above ground. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, this was the same place how it was before. How beautiful it's now. Open space, but the idea to say, um, to organize flows three dimensionally. And because of that, we can also think of public space stacked upon each other, three dimensionally. And if needed, we can also uh, further densify the city wherever it's needed. And there we go. We're almost home. And because this flywheel now is, it is autonomous self-driving because it's shared. We don't own it. We don't have to park it um, because it's CO2 neutral and it's small and silent. We can actually now really renegotiate the relation between urban mobility and architecture, the built environment, and to come up with these different typologies. And this is actually the street we left in the morning. There was a parking lot, now it's a public park. 
and we say goodbye to our neighbor. Maybe we just met him because we shared the same way, because we shared the same destination. And once we go to sleep and rest, these flywheels, these vehicles, they don't have to sleep. They can do some other jobs for us during the night. They could actually deliver goods, packets throughout the city. And it's a really three-dimensionally um, mobility concept. It's really personalized. And it's also scalable um, because it's part of the system. And it cannot fly yet, but we don't know what the future might bring. Right? So thank you very much.
do need to produce in order to accommodate the needs for the entire population of the Well, you say like one shared car replaces 10 individual owned cars. So you could calculate now, I showed the number in the beginning for Berlin, it's like 1.3 billion uh, cars we have. So if you think of this as 10, 100,000, it's nothing. It's really nothing. Think about it. It's like for, for a, how do you sell so many cars per year? It's like really nothing. But that's also the, the because it's not, how do you not be a product seller? It becomes a, um, a mobility provider. And uh, we didn't win the competition, the Team Mexico one. Um, we don't know, I mean, we gotta continue talking to them. But uh, this is, uh, there's, you know, there's other people making like this Tesla from the US. Google is thinking that way, there's many people. So I think that way. And there's a thing about 100,000 units that could serve Berlin. And we're replacing individual. Uh, with this, we, we don't replace uh, subway. And will all these things like the only company that takes care of this or? Yeah, no, it should be, um, it should be, it's also interesting what they do now. They, um, they between Mercedes-Benz and Audi and, and BMW, all these companies, they talk about um, intersections where right now they are um, electronic, they are like, um, um, US, uh, uh, what's the, the right language the cars can speak to each other. So this is virtual. We want to just take it one step further and say, like, what's the physical intersection? And now, at, you know, as long as you say everybody has the same door, you know, the, the, the vehicle in between could look totally different. And regulations um, apply to cars as well. You know, every little um, uh, new law that even comes out in Thailand, they have to incorporate into their model. So therefore, it's like the same uh, framework.
I literally, I just arrived from Brazil, like right now, directly here. I just <laughs> stopped in my hotel, I took a shower, and I came. I, it took 30 hours of flight from Brazil, so it was a long trip. I hope my English uh, is going to be a bit okay. It was very nice to, to uh, well, to, to see Max. Uh, well, I, I don't see if I, if I lost that much, but I think I, I quite of some. Yeah, okay. okay. I was wondering how amazing it would be if I could come yeah. in a different aspect. Because yeah. it took just so long, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'm very happy to be in Thailand. Well, it's a honor to be here at the university, and it's a honor to be here in Bangkok. I've been planning and I've been dreaming to come here for such a long time, so I'm really excited, and that's a really nice welcoming. I mean, arriving and directly come to the university, it's really good. So, uh, well, I think my lecture is going to uh, be, uh, how do I say, getting closer to, to, to Max as well, because what uh, we are doing at the studio in a different way is also reflecting about how the future of architecture and the future of the city is going to be, and trying to apply some of the concepts to our projects. Uh, so just to give you a, a, a brief background, I'm an architect. I, 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 I started my studies in 1999, and that was a very important year of my life, because 1999, it's not that long ago, but 99, it was the first year that I got my first email account, that I got my first uh, social networks, like Napster, MSN, Orkut, and it really changes a lot the way I was, I was uh, seeing architecture and design. And I got obsessed about how the digital technologies and the numeric technologies and the social technologies uh, are supposed to change the way we live and the way we behave and the way we, we, we see the city and the space. So for almost 10 years, I was a research of this group, which is called Nomads. If you take the chance, take a look on the website, which is the Center for Attractive Living Studies at University of Sao Paulo. So after 10 years at Nomads, when I finished my master, I, I was a bit confused. I didn't know if I was going um, gonna move to do my PhD, my doctorate, or if I was going to open my studio, and I decided to open my studio. So to me, it's very nice to be here now, because I really like to keep doing this exchange with the schools and universities. I've been traveling a lot these last two, two years, uh, showing the projects and, and teaching. So this is an image of a common occidental family from two centuries ago. And I like to start my, my lecture with this image. Who are the family are we, and who are the client are we projecting for? To whom are we doing our architecture and our design? We must know that the, 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 the notion of family is changing a lot. Uh, people are, are, are the, the, the notion of family is changing all over the world. And it doesn't matter where you are, uh, it's not related anymore to age, gender, or color skin, or body type. I mean, we understand family as love. And this is a basic notion to understood architecture, I think. This is an image from uh, ENIAC, one of the first, well, the beginning of my lecture is going to be a bit about my research and the basis of my research. And then I'm going to show you some projects. Okay. So this is ENIAC. It's considered uh, one of the first computers ever made by the man. It's from 46, 1946, so not that old. Uh, you needed more than 20 people inside ENIAC to make the computer work. And, 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 and the calculus of ENIAC was, was smaller than any calculator we have right now. And we needed a lot of people inside to make it work. This is an amazing image of one of the first well succeed prototype of mobile phone, of the, the dream of communication and walking, right? And moving. And well, not so long ago, we, we, we seen the revolution that uh, the iPhone did and all the other mobiles did. And I like to, to think about how, for architects, how the notion of public space and private space are changing a lot with this kind of device, right? For example, how many times we, we see someone uh, walking in their mobile, in the mall, or in the bus, 
and sometimes they are screaming, they are like finishing, they are breaking a relationship, or they are fighting with someone. Not so long ago, you, you used to do this inside your private house, right? And now you are in the public space. It's like carrying this mobile phone brings you a cocoon of privacy, even if you are in the middle of public space. The opposite is interesting as well. When you are inside the most private space of your life, which is your room, maybe you are in your, in your bedroom, and you open up your computer, and you, I don't know, you make a Skype, or you go to some website, or you talk to someone on the internet, it's like opening a window of a public, of a collective space inside your private space. So the boundaries between public and private are changing so much, as we just saw at, 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 at Max, at examples as well. I think this is something really interesting uh, to think about in the future. And we are, we are seeing that these technologies, they're, they're getting more and more ubiquitous. They're getting everywhere, right? We are carrying these technologies in our clothes, in our cars, in our houses, everywhere, more and more. And apart from this next step that already arrived is literally uh, mixing this, right? As fashion and, 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 and technologies, in our body. This is an image from 79, again not so long ago, this is the year I was born, and we see the guy in front is carrying the camera, and the guy, beh the guy behind is carrying the, the, the battery. This is one of the first uh, portable cameras, can you imagine? <laughs> they are shooting a, a commercial for a car. It's again not so long ago, so what we are seeing with the technology is that it, it, it goes like this. Uh, it's getting smaller, it's getting cheaper, it's getting smarter. Uh, these technologies are understanding more and more who we are, and we are understanding more and more who is this technology. So I, I'm pretty sure it's, we are a very special generation, I believe, because we are the only generation on the human history that we were born in the analogic world, and we are watching this new digital world coming up. So can you imagine, all the generations before, they just saw the analogic world, and all the next generations are just going to see the digital world. And we are just in between. We, we are the only generation in the world that are watching this, uh, this movie, right? So I think it's, I think we're special. This is a beautiful housewife in Brazil in the 50s. And she's very happy with her new technologies at home. 50s are a very uh, important uh, moment, decade, for the introduction of technologies into the home, this notion of uh, modernity into the home. This is one of the first prototypes of uh, video cassette, you know, this, this dream of having the movie inside your house. And the technology always comes with this notion of glamour. Right, so look at her, she's very clever. She's very happy with her new TV at, at home. The screen is there and all the rest is just to play the movie. This is 70s. So this is a favela in Brazil. And I really like this picture because it shows that it doesn't matter uh, uh, your economic background, if you're rich or if you're poor, the technology, the digital technology is going to arrive in your house. Uh, sooner or later. This is the beginning of the 90s and this family was uh, invited to take the picture in the most important place of their, of their home. And we can see that they choose to take the picture just beside the technologies. And if we see the technologies, they assume uh, a place as, as important as Jesus Christ is. They live together. And it does, this is the same uh, favela in Sao Paulo but from the top. Of course the technology changes, we don't use this kind of technology anymore, but it shows that it doesn't matter if you're rich or if you're poor, the technology goes to, to everybody. So MTV arrived in Brazil in 1991, and it was a very important <coughs> year to me because, well, I grew up in the countryside, and MTV was the only, was the only curator I had in my born city uh, to know the bands and the groups that I liked. For example, Madonna, Michael Jackson, The Cure, and Nirvana. 
So MTV assumed this role to be a curator, right? And I think it's very interesting if we go back in time, the culture uh, was easier to. Uh, I mean, if we go back in the medieval time, for example, it was easier to see that the culture was divided in two. One culture was produced by the by the nobles, by the rich families, right? And the other one was produced by the popular people. By after the development of, of cinema, radio, uh, and television, and, and, and newspaper, for example, we have the beginning of the notion of mass culture, right? So we still live in quite often this mass culture situation, not so much, but what does this mass culture say? It says that just a few people produces the culture that everybody else is consume, right? So for example, if I have a radio show, I don't know, 10 people produces this show on radio, for millions, for, for thousands of people listening to the radio. So the big difference right now is that after this numeric technology is that we all are producers and consumers of this culture. And I think this is the most important notion that we should know right now. And what is interesting is that we all became now uh, editors, photographers, video makers, so these technologies are allowing us to be much more creative. Right? Mm -hmm. So when I was doing my, my, my master research, I was a bit bored with architecture, and I decided to move away from architecture. And for almost two years, I studied in the art school. And it was interesting to study at the art school because uh, I think if we look into art, into contemporary art, is a way of looking into this kind of unthings. These artists, there are people who are looking into the future. They are understanding what's going on around us, and they transform it into art. So it's basic, right, to to watch uh, art. And I got involved. I I, I I first saw this idea of cyber cyborg culture. So what is what is uh, Theoretics uh, says about cyborg culture. They say that we are the first generation of cyborgs. And when we think about cyborg, we think about Robocop, right? Well, it's a little bit Robocop, but it's not really Robocop. So when they define that we are the first cyborg generation, they say that uh, it's basically through two uh, situations. In one, is that the man is getting more and more uh, technological, right? Our organic, our body is getting more and more technological. Uh, we are the very first generation that really are living into the prothesis generation, right? So prothesis that makes our body functions uh, better, or, or for example, when I lose my 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 leg and I can have uh, a prosthesis to correct it, or if I have a problem with my heart and I can use some kind of prosthesis to make it work again, or if I lose my vision and I can have a prosthesis to, to see again. But if we think about a submarine, a submarine is a prosthesis, it's an amazing prosthesis that brings my body to the zip of, uh, of, of the ocean, or a telescope is a prosthesis that allows my eyes to go to the stars, and a microscope is amazing, it's a prosthesis that allows my eyes to, to come inside my own body. So, in one hand, the man is getting more protective, it's getting more technological. In the other hand, the machines, the technology, they are getting more humanized. They are understanding more and more how do we live and how do we work. For example, I think, I'm pretty sure that our, 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 our sons and our grandsons and granddaughters, they will laugh a lot when they, when they see that we uh, access the, the cyberspace through this very poor and very old style uh, machine, which is a computer, right? It's a b-dimensional screen with uh, with this. I mean, this is this is really old. They're gonna laugh a lot. We know that there are a lot of uh, techno uh, uh, universities around the world studying new sensors and new interfaces. So we know that the computers are understanding more. For example, eye tracking, where I am looking for or heartbeat, what I'm feeling, or, or tracking my body into the space, or voice recognition, 
So the computers are understanding more and more the way we behave. So through these two notions, the body and the man getting more technological and the technology is getting more humanized, is where we got this idea of cyber culture. And this is Stellark. This is an Australian artist that I studied. And this is a, a, an art performance from the beginning of the 90s. Uh, so he worked with the notion of, of prothesis. He built this prothesis and he teach his body uh, to work with this prothesis. So he writes the, the phrase evolution with the, with, with, with the three hands. It's called the third hand uh, performance. So together with this notion of cyber culture, we have this uh, synthetic skin, for example, going on and, and, and clone, and biotechnology and nanotechnology. This is all together with this notion of cyber culture. We have the uh, uh, Steve Jobs, and this is a very interesting image that shows uh, German kids playing video game in the 80s and obsessed by the video games, right? So uh, a scientist uh, uh, proved 12 years ago in an article, in a scientific article, that kids that plays a lot of, of video games with a lot of, 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 of danger and this kind of video games that you are behind the, the scene, like shooting everybody. These kids, they have their, their, their vision, I don't know how to say in English, but when you look to, to a point, you have like a perimeter of vision. So these kids, they have a little bit bigger. So this is a scientific proof that the body is changing. Right? We don't need to read an article to see that our body is changing. Our, our, our cognition, our sensorial is changing a lot through the use of so many technologies, right? So there is something going on with the, with, uh, with, with the notion of our humanity. And I think because we are this generation that are participating to this transition, it's in our hands as well to, to develop something and to do something, especially as architects, as human planners and designers. The body is totally different. It's totally modified. This is Aibo, I don't know if you remember, this is a, a, a robot from the 2000 in Japan and it's a, well, it's a dog robot and we have the first generation of kids in love with a robot. So the, it seems that also the man is getting loved with the machine. So what the future deserves to us. There's a lot of new interfaces, and new technologies, there's a lot to come. This is my last image of this, of, of this part and this shows uh, uh, one of the first experiments 10 years ago, uh, so this experiment is about, they, they teach it the monkey that every time the monkey was hungry, the monkey should push the button and the banana would come to the monkey. So the monkey was hungry, they pushed the button and the banana come. One day they just took away the two, the two arms and they used this brain uh, machine interface and the monkey think about pushing the button and the banana come to me. So can you imagine in the future where the, the interface is gonna, could be literally plugged into our brain, how it's gonna be? There's a lot of universities and there's a lot of people studying this brain interface, this brain computer interface. And if you remember the first image I showed, this is the other one I wanna show. So to whom are we doing our architecture and our buildings and our city? is to that family or is to this new generation. Let me get some water. So, I was a bit confused, but this is just a, a brief introduction about uh, some topics that are really uh, in, interested at Studio Gutenberg right now. So, in studio, uh, we are in, in 10 people at the studio right now. Almost everybody is architect or product designer, and we are since we uh, since five years ago we finally got back to the research and we tried to combine uh, more this notion of interaction into our project. And since last year, I realized that my work is not about uh, digital technology, but it's about it's much more about memory. So I used to say that how can we shape memories into projects using digital technologies. This is what interested us right now. So this is some, uh, we're very interested about this 
notion of affective, affectivity sustainability as well. So it's not only talking about materials, but also thinking that if we can put into our projects, into our objects, uh, memory and personal histories, the life cycle of these projects is going to be probably much longer because it's not about buying something that is beautiful anymore, but it's about putting your own history and creating an object using your history in response. So I'm going to show some projects. This is the D3 office. Uh, it's from 2011. This is a very this is a small project. It's it's 40 square meters. But I want to show this project because I think again we are very uh, uh, important generation. I think. And for example, it doesn't matter anymore if you're rich or if you're not, or who is your father, who is your mother. I think if you have an interesting project and you can publish this project in a in a nice blog, for example, the Zine, Yatser, Arc Daily, whatever. Uh, the world's gonna see you, the world's gonna watch you. So this is a project I developed in 2011. It was super low budget, but Google saw this project. And after two years, Google invited me to develop their headquarter in Brazil, which is my biggest project so far. So it was a small project, but it comes with some kind of interesting concepts. And one day it was published in the blogs, and two years after, Google hired us to literally designed their headquarters in Brazil. So, yeah, this is an experience I want to share. So, it was a very tiny office, as I told, but we needed a lot of flexibility to, to make this place work. So we developed furnitures and systems that allowed, allowed this, this team to work in different ways. And we decided to put some sensors around the space to collect their daily data. So if they were talking, if they were walking, uh, and then in response we have two outputs. One is the quite of wallpaper, and the other one was the background of their website. So the website changes depending in how they behave in the in their studio. It was a very low budget pr uh, project, as I said. So we had to to make everything happen with a lo really low budget, but it was. The, the final result, I think, it was very nice. So D3 is, a, is an agency that works with interaction. Uh, you're going to see another work of them. So in 2013, we are doing a lot of set design at the, uh, at the studio. And this, is, this was the set design for an exhibition called Twitter Tour, which is an exhibition about how the literature is getting inside the Twitter and how they are merging. And it was interesting because as an architect, it was the very first time that I had to project something that was not physical, that was 100% digital. Because we had this huge screen, it was 60 meters. There's a, uh, do, do we have some? Oh yeah. Yeah. So basically in front of this screen, some kinetics. So we have some kinetics in front of the screen that could recognize where your body is. So you could literally interact with the content through the use of your body. So all the, all, the, all the notions of architecture and the body and the space was there, but in a very digital way. It was very interesting developing this project to SESC. So this is the newest project we are developing right now. It took almost two years of development and, and building, and now we are ready to release in 10 days. So this is a building in Sao Paulo. Well, Sao Paulo is a huge city. Like Bangkok, Sao Paulo is 22 million people, and it's well, it's crazy. It's just too much. And there are two uh, notions on on big city that I'm really interested, in, which is the noisy, right, the soundscape of a big city, and the air quality, right. One month ago I was in in, in Beijing, 
and I was quite of surprised with the bad air quality. The same we have in São Paulo, but apparently nothing is changing. So, well, this is called the reactive facade. So the client asked us to make to design a, a facade, but we came back to him and we said, well, instead of just doing a beautiful facade, what if we do an interactive facade? Because this building is located in a very important uh, avenue in Sao Paulo. So you're going to see, if I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm really curious about the, the music and soundscape and how can we use this in design and architecture. So for this building, we, we put a, a microphone, a special microphone, in the third floor of the building, collecting the soundscape of one day of 24 hours uh, in front of the, the building. And then we visualized this, uh, this data, this soundscape. And then what we did was we made the 3D modeling of the building. And then we rolled four times the, this, 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 this audio data into the building, representing the four moments of the day, night, morning, afternoon. And then what we said to Brad Hopper was, uh, in the highest uh, volumes, you're going to give me the gold colors. In the, in the lowest, you're going to give me dark blues, lowest blue, and then no noise, you're going to give me the, the, the gray. So the final result was something like this. We kind of created this skin that is somehow a metaphor of, of, of the, the, the soundscape. But at night, when the building, uh, when the city uh, gets night, we're going to have an uh, interactive, I call it interactive creature living in this building. So we're going to have, this building is going to turn on all the lights, and we're going to have a creature living in the building. And this, this light creature is going to change its behavior depending on two data. The first one is the soundscape. So the movement of this creature changes depending on the, on the soundscape. And the colors of this creature is going to change depending on the air quality. We created a, a, a data center here that collects the air quality of this, of this neighborhood. So warm colors like red and orange, it's going to show that this creature is quite of angry. angry. And, and green and blue, like cold colors, is going to show that the air quality is a little bit better. And we also developed a, an app for iPhone that you can uh, see all this data and you can also interact with this creature. So this is a pictures I just made like a week before coming here. The building is almost ready. And I have a video showing the first trial of the creature working. So the idea is what if in the future we could uh, have a, an architecture informing important things about our own behavior, right? about our own daily life? In this case, two simple uh, inputs, noise and air quality. It's going to be ready in a couple of days. So if you guys come to Sao Paulo, welcome to pass in front of the building and visit us. Our studio is 10 minutes walking from the building. So uh, I'm very interested about memory, as I said. This was a collection, uh, well, I'm an architect, but I'm also developing product designer, a product design. And this is a collection called Once Upon a Time. So yeah, there's a video. I think it's going to explain there. I E eu sentava numa poltrona e eu contava história. 
Às vezes eu esqueço do pedaço. <risos> Porque tá, a gente esquece do pedaço, então a gente inventa alguma coisa. Eu gostava também de dramatizar. Então contava a história das sete capitinhas, então imitava a voz do louco. E eu floreava tudo aqui, enfeitava a história. E quando a gente conta uma história, não é exatamente como está no livro. Né? O interessante é a gente dramatizar, mas os netos todos gostavam, porque eu acho que não são todas as avós que têm paciência e gostam, né? E gostam de contar história. Interessante, porque não passa tão depressa, né? A gente não percebe. vasos era uma vez, ela manifesta, né, ela procura mostrar alguns princípios que são base do estudo muito requena hoje. Então a questão da memória afetiva, a questão das novas tecnologias digitais, né, como a, as novas mídias, as novas tecnologias numéricas influenciam no design, influenciam na arquitetura e fundamentalmente a questão da brasilidade né, ou da produção artesanal, que eu acho que são pilares do estúdio muito pequeno e que de alguma maneira aparecem na coleção. Então, para a coleção, eu fui me inspirar nas histórias que a minha avó me contava na infância. Então, a gente é, buscou quatro histórias e a gente transformou o arquivo de áudio num arquivo visual, utilizando a linguagem do Processing. Então, essa curva que é gerada pelo Processing, ela é a transposição literal do drama narrativo da minha avó. Depois que a gente criou essa curva, a gente deixou ela de pé e rotacionou ela, né? de maneira que a gente cria uma forma 3D. Ou seja, é um arquivo de áudio, uma história da minha avó, que literalmente vira uma forma 3D. Eu tinha que ir coisas para Aqui no Belanzinho, se instalaram as primeiras fábricas, e houve o desenvolvimento de toda a indústria do dinheiro nacional. É uma equipe que a gente se complementa, como se fosse um campo de futebol, você tem que ter o cara que defende bem, o cara que ataca bem. E aí a gente consegue montar uma praça, que é o nome que a gente dá a um grupo de vidreiros que estão reunidos para montar, uma, montar uma, uma peça ou produzir uma peça. Você fica em casa, cara, você fica, sabe, aquele, você fica incomodado querendo trabalhar e voltar, se esse calorzinho mesmo. Ele falou o calorzinho gostoso e tal, já acostumamos já, então a gente gosta de fazer, são 40 anos, né? Ele faz peça grande, eu faço peça pequena. Porque ele não dá o vidro, eu faço que é o vidro completo, não existe, o vidro completo. Eu faço tudo, mas para o vidro não existe. Todo mundo que vem aqui, olha, vê o vidro mole e não acredita, né? Ele ficava gostando, quer aprender, quer fuçar. Nós buscamos na transparência do cristal a mesma transparência que as pessoas deveriam buscar em suas próprias vidas. Oi, se apoia para mim. De Ham is a little bird from Europe. De Ham was sick and it lost all her And, uh, she was so this was a very, uh, it was a very, of course, a very personal work because that's my grandmother, right? So I grew up uh, listening her stories, and when I was invited to make this exhibition in Milan, I, I, I decided that I should bring something very personal. So we developed uh, 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 an interface that analyzes the narrative drama into her voice and generates this draw. So depending on the suspect, if she's happy or not in the voice, it generates this curve. And that's how we, and then we rotate, and, that, and then that's how we got the 3D shape. So it's like my, my, my personal memories, my affective memory, is, it's, it's the big uh, creation of the project. And then it's combined with this very digital and this very artisanal technologies. That was a very beautiful uh, factory. Uh, they were the, the, the fourth generation that arrived 
from Italy, bringing in, uh, to Brazil the technique of glass blowing. So it was it, it was a honor to work with them because in the in the 90s there were 2,000 uh, artisans doing the glass blowing technique, and now there are only four. So the the, the, the glass blowing technique it's dying, right? Not only in Brazil but all over the world. So how can we? I don't know, use both technologies and how can we... So to me it was very important to, to make this video and very personal, of course, not only because, of, because it shows my grandmother, but also because uh, it shows this very special factory. So after this experiment, I created a, a chair, which is called the noisy chair. And again, the same thing I said before, uh, I created this project and it was so much published in so many blogs after 2012 that I keep uh, traveling a lot. This year I went to, to China, to Moscow, uh, to Istanbul, I mean to many different countries, to Milan, to show this, this chair. Uh, let's show a little video. So that's historical downtown in Sao Paulo, and that's the moment I was walking and collecting the soundscape in the historical downtown, and that I think it's a very interesting uh, place in Sao Paulo, especially in terms of noise. So what we did was, uh, this is, uh, it's called the giraffe chair, it's from the 80s, it's from Lina Bobardi, it's a very important and well-known architect, uh, Brazilian, Italian-Brazilian architect, and in my opinion, well, she's the best, in my opinion, the best architect in Brazil, and she created this chair, so it, quite, it was part of my homage uh, to her as well. Uh, so what we did, we, we got this chair into my studio, and we 3D scanned this chair, and then we combine these two data, so the subscape with the, the, the 3D modeling. And the result is, is a 3D printed chair. It's 3D printed in Belgium, it's ABS, it's black ABS. And it was interesting because somehow it's a way of seeing and touching the soundscape, right? It's combining something that was impossible to combine uh, years ago. And I think this is a notion that is very interesting as well. Once everything became numeric, once everything became zero one zero 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 one, you can you can mix things that were unmixable before, as music and design, for example. And what I like about this chair as well is that it 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 brings a lot this notion of uh, authorship. So who is the author of this chair? Is it me? Is it Lina Bobardi? Is it the soundscape? Is it the engineers that work with me? So it's all together. And I think uh, design and architecture is getting more and more uh, uh, similar to, to the cinema industry, for example. I don't believe in the future we're going to have like these top designers or top architects' names anymore. I believe we're going to work more and more in, in, a, in, a, in a collective way, more and more in a multidisciplinary way more people working together, exactly like the cinema industry does. In the end of a movie, you have so many names involved. Yes, you have a director, but you have so many names involved to make that move happen. And I think design and architecture is getting more and more like this. So, uh, for Sao Paulo Design Week that happens every August, we decided to make a performance, it was last year, uh, opening the process of noisy chair to the public. So what we did, I have a short movie. We project, we, so this is, was in a gallery in Sao Paulo. We projected the, the, the data of the original chair, the giraffe chair in the wall. And then we put the computer with the grasshopper and we explained it to everybody that was curious how does it work. And we put a microphone in front of the chair, of the image of the chair. 
So anyone could produce music and sounds in the microphone, and you could watch the distortion of the original chair in the, in the wall. And then we had a small 3D printer, a Brazilian 3D printer, printing small chairs, printing the result of it. Uh, their own noisy chair so they could understand the entire process right since the beginning with the image to the production of the sounds and the small chairs and it was very nice because as you could see a lot of kids discovered the exhibition and it became a huge success between the kids in the neighborhood somehow they all end up in the in the in, in, in the gallery and so I think working with kids is something that really interested me right now so this is my last project we just released, it's called the Love Project. So I'm very interested about how can we use these digital technologies in a more humanistic, in a more organic, in a more uh, cozy way. Because I think this is a notion that the world needs right now, right? To get more human, humanized. And so what we did was, I, in this project, it's, well, it, it's an interface we developed. It was a big team, it was a big group to make this development almost two years. So we, we invite people to tell, their big, to tell us their biggest love stories. We include many sensors in this guest, as brainwave, heartbeat, and voice recognition. And we collect this emotional data. We know when we are in love, or when we are nervous, our body produces different data, right? Our heartbeat faster. Our brain wave activity changes. We sweat more when we are nervous. So this is emotional data that I was interested in. And I was like, what if we use this emotional data to build objects, to build daily objects? So this is one of the interfaces we developed. Uh, it's an interface that analyzes all this data. So we, we can watch live this interface working and showing the heartbeat, the, the brain wave, and the voice for example. And then we developed what I call this particle uh, principle. So this, this is particles that they grow in a gravitational, gravitational camp. So you must choose the object you want to produce. So for example, a vase, a fruit bowl, or a lamp. So once you choose the object you want, for example, the vase, these particles, they will grow from the bottom to the top. And the, and the behavior of each particle is going to change depending on your emotion. So for example, uh, the, the voice changes the velocity of the particle. The heartbeat changes the thickness. And the, and the brain wave changes the attraction and repulsion between those particles. So in the end, the parametric rules are the same. But because each story is different, because each uh, emotion is different, the, re the final result is totally different. So you can generate uh, uh, different shapes and different phases and different fruit poles. And then it's, tr it's 3D printed. I have a video that shows it. I hope you can read the subtitles.
sabe, mas de mãe é, é nós fazer tudo. Porque toda mãe tem sua emoção. Só nascer seu filho já quer vê-la, né? Gosto muito da minha filha, faço tudo por ela, né? No momento que a gente pode ajudar, né? Então, a gente se emociona mesmo, igual você falou, né? Os, os filhos, a gente tem os filhos, mas aí depois que vem os netos, acho que tem os netos também. O amor dos netos também. Quando eles estão, chega, me abraça, me beija. É muito importante a família ser unida. Nós temos uma família unida, unida. Dez anos atrás, é, que é o dia para mim o mais emocionante da minha vida, ele acha que eu sou uma criança grande. A gente conversa de um jeito é, que eu nunca conversei com ninguém. Tudo que eu faço há dez anos, é, eu sempre no final, eu acho que eu fiz para ele, por ele, e é muito emocionante mesmo. É, entender esse amor, o amor de mãe incondicional, do pai, do irmão, eu acho que é a, a forma mais pura de amar alguém. E essa é a minha história de amor. avós. É... Era uma carta cheia de juras de amor e de promessas de encontro e demonstração de saudade e de carinho. E na verdade o que mais me toca nessa história toda é o quanto ela se dedicou ao meu avô e meu avô a ela. Me toca ver que Amor é possível. Instead of buying a beautiful object to your mother's anniversary, you could, for example, narrate some story or something that makes you remember her and create an object especially for her. Probably this object, uh, it's good, the life cycle of this object is going to be much longer there than a regular object. Maybe one day when your mother passes away, this object is going to stay in the family, someone is going to hold it for next generations. So this is a bit of... So we call Pro Love Project because we developed a system and now we want to apply the system in different ways. Uh, okay, so... I have to show you one more video. Sorry about not having the video because it just produced it and I don't have it here. Okay, how can I make it smaller? So to release out oh, here, so to release the video, we, to release the collection, we made a performance, another performance in Sao Paulo, which is called the Love Project performance, 
and it happened in a in a in an art gallery called Varo. So for two days uh, in Sao Paulo, we invited people to come and tell us their love story. And we collected 53 love stories in two days. First, we exhibited for the first time the result, the first experiments. But then we had a, a separate room in the gallery where anyone could come. We plugged the sensors. We 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 let we left the people alone in this room telling their love stories. I'm not interested in the story itself, so we, I don't record. I'm just interested in the body uh, emotional data produced. And then we created mandalas, like small pieces that was easier and faster to print. Parametric rules are the same as I told, right? So voice gives the velocity, heartbeat gives the thickness, and brainwave the attraction and repulsion. But because it's story and each emotion is different, the final result from 53 love stories were 53 totally different mandalas. And was super beautiful because we didn't expect but many people cried. It was, was super. It was super strong. The experience there, ah, here it is. Because when so at the performance at the gallery, we had uh, we when we invited someone to tell their love story, we had a Doppler sensor in the that collects the volume of your heartbeat. So when you get inside the gallery, it was like tutu, tutu. You couldn't see where the person was because there was a law. But suddenly you could listen that they were getting more nervous. It was like, tutu, 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 tutu. And you could watch the, the live sensors working. And then when they left from the room, they were crying. It was such a strong experience. And it was so beautiful to see that, yes, technology and design can make, could make people get so emotional there at the, at, the, at the gallery. So this is the final results. And uh, it, it was a big surprise. We didn't know that in the end the mandalas would be so beautiful. So the last couple who did this performance, uh, they were so emotional. They were crying so much. Everybody was crying when they saw Of course, we're Brazilians. We cry a lot. <laughs> but in the end, uh, they decided to get a tattoo with the with the with the with, with the drawing. So the next uh, performance we're doing is going to be in April in Sao Paulo, and it's going to be the Love uh, uh, Project Tattoo. So we, 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 we are doing this in a, in a museum in Sao Paulo. We're going to have 10 tattoo uh, guys doing tattoo. So we're going to collect love stories. And when you leave the room, you're going to visualize bidimensionally your love story. And then you can get your, 
love story tattooed in your body. So I think it's going to be interesting because it's a mix between tattoo, art, design, and technology. So maybe next time I come, I can show you the result. Uh, so I just want to finish. I'm, so, I'm really sorry about my English. I, I, I can't find the words after three days awake. But I want to say again that it's in our hands to, to see how these technologies can be used as architects, as urban planners, or designers. I mean, and the future is beautiful, and it's bright, and it's in our hands. So let's use these technologies, and let's use the tradition and the culture, and everything we have to make a better place, to make a better future. I think this is the, the, the only and the best use we, we, can, we can have for digital technologies and for architecture and design. And so I think if we use it in this way, the future is going to be better because we should be closer and we should be uh, together doing this, right? So, and this is the website and everything. Thank you very much. I have seen your project, it was so nice. And I wonder, um, as I see every object coming up from the center, is there anything from the script? Or is that related to your heartbeat or brain or emotional? Because it seems um, symmetrical. I just wonder about it. Yeah, uh, it was well because I wanted to do design, so it, it must have a function. So, for example, to 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 be a vase, it must have a shape to contain something, right? So that was a challenge. Uh, which kind of uh, scripting we could use? to make it uh, be functional. So yeah, it all starts from one point and it grows. It was the, in this experiment, the way we found to make it grow up. In the noisy chair, for example, uh, we did different uh, scripting and all of them, the chair was like balancing, the chair was not standing up. And then it's art, right, and not design. So I think the challenge in our projects, it's, well, we want to, we want these uh, objects to be functional. So, to be a chair, you, you must sit in the chair, right? When we started doing the love project, the first experiments were very beautiful. Maybe one day we can release them, but the particles, they were growing like to all the like all directions. So in the end, it was like a beautiful object, but it was art, not design. So then we came up with this idea of this gravitational camp. So it is a way of keeping the particle going back and forward, but not so much back and forth. So then we can, in the end, have a functional shape. Yeah. So what is the more important for you, the ideas or the software? Sorry? What is the more important for you, the software or the idea? Because uh, in like uh, 2014 or 15, in your presentation, 50, yeah, the technology would change so much. What, what, what can you see yourself in 2014? Five years. Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think I think though what I what I, what I'm working right now a lot uh, is I want to come with these projects more in the urban scale. So yes, I like doing product design, but I think well, I live in a city that has has so many problems, uh, São Paulo, that it's good to be there right now as an architect and urban planner because there is problems, there is money, and there is people that want to design this the solutions, right? So I see myself in the future acting more and more in the urban scale. So uh, I, I showed you two experiments for love project. I told you about the third, which is going to be the tattoo, and we are developing the fourth. The idea of the fourth is it's doing the love project in a facade. So creating an interactive facade 
that somehow is an output for this emotion. So the idea is it's getting more and more to the city. But to me, it doesn't. Well, I have my, my background is architecture, but I think it doesn't matter the scale of the of the problem. Uh, what it's nice uh, about being an architect is that we 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 learn how to deal with a problem and a solution and developing a methodology. And then it doesn't matter if you are doing a small phase or if you're doing a building or a urban plan. Of course, these are different problems. But what I like about being an architect is that we can move to these different scales, right? And so I think I hope I can, in the future I see myself doing more urban solutions, yes. I know everybody's super hungry, so if maybe after these two lectures, if you guys can want to send us questions by email, I have my email, I think Max gave as well, right? Yes. Um, just some comments. Both of you are practicing architect, right? You have your own office, and you did a lot of experiments and ideas. How all that can be integrated into the education uh, for the architect students? In the first, how, how we integrate our work into university and, and education. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Well, I, I did my master, so I did my research. It was almost nine years there, and then I decided to start developing my projects, so doing my experiments. So. Uh, trying all the concepts that I studied in the university into my works. Well, now I miss a lot being at university, so I'm really planning the next future doing a PhD, doing a doctorate somewhere. But at the moment, I'm, I'm trying more and more to go to the schools, like teaching and giving workshops and being in, in laboratories, like uh, digital laboratories. So in Brazil right now, I'm, I'm getting more and more involved with the students, even if I'm not a as a fixed professor, I'm trying to. I think I see. I see myself as a bridge between the 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 market and the university. So I'm trying to build these bridges between market and university. So bringing students to to special projects and bringing these projects to universities. So trying to make this network, this connection between the academic research and the and the and the solutions we must have because the time is different right sometimes in university you can stay one or two years researching one topic which is very important then you can go really deep into the into the subject but in, sometimes in the market in the real life you must have you have a problem and you must solve in two months so how do you 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 you, you make these bridges right I think what's really interesting in Europe as well right now, the question, where is the innovation happening? Is it at the school, the university, or is it happening in the industry? And as we as a studio are collaborating with the industry, we are, we are looking for the collaboration with the schools as well. And I think the combination um, is very powerful if you can bring the industry and the school together. And uh, we are talking to the Zurich um, ETH because of this one project, the Shelf project, uh, together together with other um, institutes there to form a research uh, group, more or less. And um, I think it's I think it's a very good question. I think it's very important also to take these this craziness into school because um, I experienced myself in my I don't know I guess nobody can speak. Uh, uh, that now, but in my school it was really frustrating for me because I think it was very traditional and uh, I had the feeling I learned things. Same, same. <laughs> you, uh, you, you, uh, you have it in your hands, no? You can change it today. No? So, um, and um, but I think it was really um, the way uh, we weren't taught to think, we were taught to execute. And I think this is something uh, we as architects, we are, um, our speciality is to solve problems and to uh, come up with creative solutions, uh, not necessarily building a house. And I think this is uh, uh, something we should um, force more at the um, schools as well. Yeah. 
And I also think, and you probably do the same, like we, the way we try to um, to work in the studio, it's uh, it's, it's it's a studio itself, and uh, you know if you can take the the work, the kind of very research work into a um, commercial work, I think that's a big. Challenge. They give you one more. <laughs> one more. No, no. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. You listen. The point is that suppose you can design a house or a condominium or whatever, you want, and the people who live in there uh, have some uh, uh, reflections on the facade of the of the house. The color of the house may change according to the the what they are doing according to the percentage of corruption, for example. <laughs> and you will see the Thai political Thai politicians probably, oh, this is most corrupt because of the color uh, expressing. You know, can you do do that? <laughs> yeah. You guys, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Let's go to the democracy is great. Good luck, guys. You have a nice future waiting for you. <laughs> so, thank you for a uh, fantastic lecture today. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Dr. Vipon Sit to give a gift for the lecturer.